We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Hello everybody and welcome to part two of Adam's interview with Dick Beaumont, the CEO and founder of Kraken Yachts. If you haven't seen part one yet, there's a link to up here where they discuss all things about blue water boat design. If you are looking for a specific question, timestamps are down below, but enjoy part two of the interview. To, it might be a little, not inappropriate, but maybe a contentious point, but is that not a, a slight contradiction with the ethos of what you've built. You've built this boat that can't sink, that can go anywhere, that can carry what it needs to carry for, for self-sufficiency and self-reliance um, to go where there is no help. Only yes. if your generator runs and you've got your power winches and well, you've got all that fancy kit. No, all you know? of this gear, all of this gear will also work manually. It will all stand up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't be reliant. Generators okay, okay. will pack up. Yeah. Um, there's a, you know, if I can just make a, it's going to be, I suppose, a promotional point Go about cracking yachts. Um, actually, I can tell you, because I've noted it in one of my little books, as I told you, <laughs> yeah. and eighty percent, roughly, of problems on blue water cruising boats are fuel related. If you can solve the contaminated fuel issue then you can rely on your generator much more and that's good because then you'll have refrigeration uh, and you'll have all of the things that you need el electrically to give you those mod cons so in a Kraken yacht you know standard this is not an extra there are three tanks not two there's a port storage tank there's a starboard storage diesel tank and there is a running tank in the middle and you cannot directly put fuel into the running tank. It has to come from the port or starboard tank via a, a filtration system, oh, a fuel sure. polishing system, right. into the running tank. So a day tank, I haven't heard So that. it's, it's, not, well, it's a been, day tank, really a running been, tank. Yeah. It, it lasts much longer than a day. Yeah. Yeah. But in a Kraken yacht, you cannot run the generator and the engine on contaminated fuel you can't do it because it has to get there via polish via polishing system moonshadow didn't have that and if you sail around uh, anywhere in southeast asia and a lot of other places in the world papua new guinea the same thing you you are going to have to take on board uh, in a impure fuel you, or you're not going to get any fuel i sailed from singapore to go to bali it was very very poor uh, winds the whole time it was nearly flat calm. We either had we either had thirty knots or nothing, and we started to get pretty short on fuel. And I looked up uh, an island that I hadn't intended to visit, um, Indonesian island, uh, on the way to Bali. And uh, so, okay, look, you know, I think we'll need to go in there. We're nearly out of fuel, so we we get in there and we get to the guy that's the um, they call it solar. In, uh, uh, in, these, in the region of Southeast Asia. So we get to the solar man who's living in a shack and we pull off the front cover uh, of uh, a big 100 gallon uh, steel drum, several steel drums sitting in his front garden and he gets out a hand pump mm. and there's another good friend of mine, Toby, who's with me and he's helping and he says, stop, Nick, stop, stop, stop. So I said, Toby, what, what's the matter? He said, look at the shit that there's in this. There's leaves and sticks all floating oh, around no. in this thing. So I said, yeah. So he said, well, we can't put that in our tank stick. I said, you're right. Why don't we just go to the shell garage around the corner? <laughs> he said, what? So I said, it's this or nothing. We have to find, you know. And that started me on a on a plan that eventually wound up with me having building a little uh, kind of wooden holder uh, plugging plug in I could plug it into 12 volt um, had a rake or filter and a pump from that moment on I didn't decant anything directly into my tanks right. and, and, and wherever we went after that we used to rate the fuel as one to ten cockroaches 
And one cockroach was only had a few bits floating around it, and ten there was shit going around all over. The, but but you've got to use that. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's right. all. You don't have any fuel. So is that one of your ten or seven key must-haves? No, nice it, no, have? no, no. It isn't. It's very desirable. Right. But that's not a strike it off because you can you can do what I did you yeah, can develop a little hand it. it's linked to something that is quite important if you analyse well what could go wrong and what's terrible we've already talked about the kill coming off is the ultimate and the next probably most dangerous situation is the loss of steerage which we've talked about as well and after that probably comes fire right there is no crack in the yacht built that has gas on board for that very reason so all and the induction cooking and all... All, all like, electric cooking wow. via the generator. So I'm going to say that third, if you're looking at what you must avoid, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be gas on board the boat. Okay. Fourth is going to be hull layup and the thickness of hull because it's just not compatible mm -hmm. to be talking about sailing around these oceans in boats with five or six mil thick hulls. Technology has improved in yacht building to enable you to make the, the, the hulls thinner and thinner. But that's fine if your big goal is to reduce weight or cost. Mm. <laughs> cost is gonna figure quite a lot in the discussions. Big asterisk. Although, yeah, they're not, they're not, the boat builder's not gonna tell you that. But you can go to a composite engineer and he can explain to you how that five mil hull is adequate mm -hmm. uh, strong enough for for the boat yeah but not if you hit something and not if you go aground and there's when you need the heavier layup a kraken has an average layup of uh 15 to 17 layers what's it, that in mils uh, and is 15 mil thick at its wow. thinnest part. At its thinnest part. At its thinnest, wow. not its thickest, yeah. but its thinnest part. So that's like top sides and yeah, then below yeah. the water. Fiberglass composites, as they are now called, is a fantastic product. But in my view, especially if you're going to use the term blue water, which is your point, mm -hmm. uh, you can't start reducing it to its minimum strength capacities mm. for the job <clears throat> even though an engineer is going to tell you yeah yeah no it's fine actually what i'm saying is there has to be a very heavy margin mm. and the boat mustn't be flexing it has to be rigid and massively strong some of our clients uh, ask us about oh well you know have you thought about building in aluminium uh, and the answer is yes, we've considered that, but actually a heavily laid up quality composite hull with which they which our boats do have um, Kevlar uh, oh, sections. Oh, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. all, all the crash points. That's far stronger than uh, aluminium is going to be. Our objective wasn't then to try and do that and make the boat cheap and light our objective was to do that and make the boat strong and bomb proof yep. so we've got past fire and and now we gain what, what else can be of risk well going overboard is then of course another big risk um, and so to our mind uh, a center cockpit is essential and a deep center cockpit mm -hmm. if you go to the boat shows and you look at the aft cockpit boats the helm seat I don't know how people it's, are staying on them. If a wave sweeps that boat, you've got to be somewhere that is protected and is, is not going to leave you immediately vulnerable to go overboard. And a center cockpit does that. The next thing is a rig design, a running rigging design that enables you to do everything, hoist and lower, trim and furl, put the sails away completely, trim the sails, handle them in every way you can from the cockpit. Right. And because if you don't go on deck, then you've got much greater chance of, of not going overboard, haven't you? It's obvious. Yeah. If you do go on deck, and let's be truthful, you, you will have to. It will happen. Right? Yeah, totally. You then come to one of the next things that's in, in my consideration. And that is not simply clipping on and jack lines, which of course are vitally important, but 
how do you brace yourself uh, on a sloping wet deck mm. without slipping out underneath the safety lines? Mm. And in Kraken, it's, it's an expensive thing to do because it requires an extra moulding and it's a two-piece moulding and there's a lot of time goes into it. But the bulwark or the cap rail is shaped so that the inside of it is a concave semicircle so that when your foot is bracing against that it's sitting in the curve in there Under your something. foot is in there mm -hmm. it's not doing that and sliding mm -hmm. off right up on the bow of the boat you can be you can be clipped on but if you slip and you go over the boat you there's almost nowhere you can possibly work out to stop a, a, a safety harness um, and keep you in the boat. Mm. Further back from the bow, there is, yeah. of course. Up you on can, the pointy end, yeah, it's a yeah. bit different. Well, once you're up on the pointy end, as you say, <laughs> um, you're going to go through and over. So a bracing position, a consideration of that whole design uh, is, is then very important. And I think the seventh point is consideration of and the biggest risk then is dismasting yeah because if a mast comes down if somebody doesn't get hurt or killed it is quite a miracle yeah. and so how do you overcome that well for a start off you don't even consider the con concept of a deck step mast you have to go through the deck mm -hmm. and step the mast on the keel because you cannot say, despite however strongly the boat is rigged, that a, a, a stay or a you shroud won't stay. part. Yeah. If it parts and you have a boat that has a keel step mast, it's braced at the deck. Mm. And so you have a much greater opportunity to free off the sails, take the pressure off the rig and run a halyard to replace wherever that is. So the two things combined, I'm gonna say, is a keel stepped mast is mandatory for me mm -hmm. with a very heavily built rig. So for example, on a, a, a Kraken 50, the standard uh, rigging size is 14 mil. It's not mandatory feature to have a solid rig. Oh, okay. Right? So that it, it is on a Kraken. Oh, I it see. It comes okay. as standard. Yeah. But in terms of, will I discount this boat as being a blue water cruising boat if it doesn't right. have a sailing rig? No, that would be crazy. Mm. Is it extremely desirable to have a sailing rig? Mm. It's the most fantastic rig that you can have for blue water cruising because the versatility of that rig. I'll give you that. And to be able to have a working uh, full-size jib and Genoa, but without the bloody dreaded running backstays. Mm. I mean, yeah. running backstays, you will forget them sometimes. They will sit there, you will go about, and then, ah, oh, yeah, the boom will hit them. Yeah. And it can do a, an awful lot of damage. They run, the, what you do with a Solent rig is the uh, inner force stay, the jib stay, mm -hmm. goes much higher. Two just below the cap of the mast, just down from the mast. And then the back stays uh, are to the top of the mast, of course, and harden. So the rig is actually uh, a fractional rig. Yeah. Um, but it enables you then to put a nice bend in the mast, which you need to stop it inverting and going forward and breaking. Mm -hmm. um, but you've then got uh, a Genoa, mm. uh, a jib. Uh, and of course a full uh, a full main, but it goes on further with a silent rig because Moonshadow was a staysail. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right, yeah. And I sat there for hours and hours and hours, utterly pissed off the fact I hardly ever use the staysail right. unless the wind is in that dead right position. Yeah. And so many times I found that I wanted to use staysail because it was tracked uh, inside. Uh, the shrouds mm -hmm. and could therefore go tighter to the wind mm -hmm. but it wasn't big enough to drag the boat upwind yep. so 
I actually thought I'd invented the Solent Rig. I must tell you, I drew it all out and I went to, to see um, oh my the God, next big thing. <laughs> I went and, oh, I, it's it's true. I went and, I, I was so deflated. <laughs> I, I went to see, when I was having the concept of uh, White Dragon was being developed, I went to see a sailmaker in Hong Kong and I said, you know, hey Barry, listen, I think I've got, I think I've nailed it here. <laughs> I said, I can't understand why we don't take the staysail right the way forward to within a metre of the Genoa, mm. take the stay right up the top to within a metre of the top of the mast, mm. and then we've got a full-size working jib and a Genoa, and we don't need back stays because we're not yeah. got them pulling forward in the centre of the mast. The, you know. He said, oh, you mean a Solent rig? <laughs> I said, oh, do I? Oh. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, 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 that's exactly <laughs> yeah. what I meant. I was just checking with you. So one of the things, and I've, I've not sailed on a Solent, so I don't know, I have no basis of comparison, but one of the things I love about my cutter is that if the proverbial hit the fan and it's 40, 50 knots, I can reduce right down to a staysail and the centre of effort is back and right. down yeah. and small. And hey, I can what, keep shrinking, right? The sail uh, on the jib mm. is referred to as a blade jib. Right. So... Uh, its uh, leech is almost vertical. I see. And, okay. its, and its foot s almost sweeps the deck. Yeah. And the reason for that is to keep the centre of effort so low mm -hmm. because when you're bashing hard up the wind, mm -hmm. uh, Joe and Maud don't really want to spend 10 days on their ear. No. It's not fun. And you're doing this all for fun, right? Let's let's focus on that bit. Yeah, this important. is something we're voluntarily <laughs> yeah. doing. No. You can buy the plane ticket <laughs> <Right>. and just <laughs> yeah, so so you you now bring the centre of load down. The boat will be able to carry much more wind, uh, or carry much more sail, and the boat will not stall. One of the problems that you'll have had with a staysail. Oh Jesus! You know she's just not got enough sail area to drive me forward mm -hmm. unless it's a full-on gale. Yeah, it takes. And months. and now the boat is the you know there's a bit of chop and now the boat starts to stall. Mm -hmm. uh, and now you think, oh well, bugger it! What I've got to do actually is oh, I've got to fall off the wind and go back to my Genoa. Yeah. A reefed or whatever but the problem with a reef genoa of course is the center of uh, effort is so much higher so you're getting much more uh, healing mm. and that, actually that's another point that is mandatory uh, i think which is to have a boat that has uh, a very good writing moment yes uh, in the kraken says 135 degrees wow the boat can be knocked down Till the sail is 135 de uh, degrees, mm. so 45 degrees below the vertical, mm. and she'll still come up without rolling. I, I, I kind of missed. I suppose that makes it eight points. Yeah. <laughs> I lost count. Yeah, yeah, I lost. Yeah, <laughs> we had some very heavy weather um, when we crossed after Saint Helena uh, on the way up um, uh, to the Cape Verde Islands uh, after Ascension. We also went into Ascension, um, and. Uh, we there was a, a you know a nasty storm came through, um, and I could I knew it was coming because now hey got we got satellite yeah. we got satellite communications which is a bigger step forward in terms of safety in my opinion than than even a life raft, you know because you can you can you I mean I'm going to tell you a funny little story that was told to me by one of our uh, clients that uh, was you know looking at krakens. Um, we don't show at boat shows. We we're not trying to sell fifty boats or a hundred mm -hmm. boats a year. I want to I want to build five or six boats, and I want to build those to be the best for yeah. blue water cruising. But a client of mine phoned me up and he said, "Oh, Dick, you know, I just uh, I've just been on to the uh, Geno stand." He said, "And uh, I was looking at the Geno fifty four. I think it was a fifty four. He said, and you." He said, uh, I asked the salesman, how is this boat going to go in heavy weather? So I said, oh, yeah, you know, fair question. He said, well, what do you think he said? So I said, I don't know, what did he say? So he must have said, yeah, there's lots of these sailing around the world, sir. So, yes, this boat can sail anywhere. He said, no, no. He said, well, th then he's going to have said the boat is designed for that. And, yeah, it's fine. He said, no, 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 you're not even close. I said, come on, come on, come on. Tell me exactly what he no, said. He said, sir, you'll never know. 
So I said, what do you mean? He said, what? He said, uh, well, you'll never know, sir, because this boat is so fast, you'll outrun the wind. <laughs> I knew that was where that was going. Oh, my God. So that was one of my questions here, because this gets thrown around in my, my space. Does it? Often. And Does it? And I want to do, and I'm perhaps not a good What are you going to do? You're going to be halfway across the Tasman <laughs> Sea, and there's a big front coming, yeah. and, you, you know, if you're going across the Tasman Sea in New Zealand or Australia or the other way, and plenty of other places... South Africa, the Southern Oceans, anywhere like that. And you, you'll have a line squall coming that is 250 miles long, mm. right? What are you going to do? Turn around and go back and say, oh, no, it's a bit windy. <laughs> no, no, come on. It's this, absurd, this is right? just absurd stuff. To you, me, you, that's the equivalent of a soldier going into battle without body armour and saying, it's cool, I've got really fast reflexes. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah. It's absurd. Oh, that's a good one. It's a that's a good shot. one, Adam. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, I tell you something that I believe to be critical, and that is this. I don't know why 35 knots of wind is the mark, and it doesn't matter, though, whether the boat's 30 foot, 50 foot, or 100 foot. At 35 knots of wind, it all gets very serious and real. Mm. The jokes stop, and it's serious game. So, and I tell you, the answer is really this. At 35 knots of wind, you need a yacht that is capable of looking after the crew. You don't need a yacht that has got to be managed by the crew to survive it. And I'm, you're not going to go and hove to it necessary to get through 35 knots of wind. But now put another 30 knots on top of that wind and you start talking about... 60 knots of wind or 70 knots of wind mm. this is not funny anymore no. and a boat that can't hove to it actually as i suppose now that's no oh, it must be nine or ten <laughs> Seven, a, eh? <laughs> a boat that can't hove to and weather that out is not a blue water cruising boat so, so i suppose within that vein brings is a, is a great segue into the cat discussion what are your thoughts on, given this, that you've got powerful and very entrenched uh, views, and, and not without merit, might I add, about what makes a blue water boat, what are, you, what, is it, what are your feelings about the way there's, you know, explorer cats and blue water cats and, and everybody's doing all these things in cats now because they're in vogue? Um, what are your thoughts on that? I can just, uh, well, I'm going to say they're not for me. Um, there's some fundamental issues that I think uh, cross them off the list. Of course, they don't really in any sense have a kill, so therefore they can't be uh, crossed off the list because their kill might come off. Mm -hmm. But principally, I see a problem in the concept of a cruising catamaran. Not catamarans per se, because, I mean, hey, you know, you watch the uh, what's going on in the America's Cup, and they're a fantastic machine. They're good fun. But the principle of a catamaran must be that it sits on the water. It doesn't sit in the water. Um, and as such, sitting on the water, okay, it can get off and go fast and do all those things that we know cats are good for. The problem for me, and trying to combine that and conflate that into blue water cruising, is I know when you go blue water cruising, you take the sink, the cat, the dog, 10 tonne of gear that you never thought you are going to do. Even at the beginning, mm -hmm. you may have minimised, but then you realise you need that socket set and this spanner and this do and that. Do and, that. and before you know where you are, you've sat the boat down in the water. I think no blue water cruising boat sits at the original design waterline. Mm. They all sit down because of a huge amount of gear that you put in it. And that doesn't create a, a stability issue, I think, because hey, it's got the it's got the it's got the form stability. But then it's not able to do what it really needs to do, which is to slide and to skim. Mm. Um, because it's now in the water. So f for that reason, that I think the, the inherently they are going to try and carry more weight than they're really designed for. 
But you've got other issues as well, um, which is to do with the emotion. I know there's a huge amount of nonsense being talked about. Um, you know, it originally the phrase started, gentlemen don't beat, and yeah, everybody runs off the wind. Yeah, of course you want to, but it's not the reality, you know, and you've got to get contrary winds at times, and you're going to have to go through them, and cats don't go well up wind. I know every cat owner that you ever talk to says, I oh, know, but my one does. Mine's I know different. all of that. Yeah, mine's <laughs> different. But, uh, yeah, I'm not really buying into that. And the motion they uh, present going upwind isn't pleasant. I mean, you need new fillings in all your teeth by the time you've bashed up wind hard in the cat. But the big thing that really discounts them for me, the, the, the cardinal point is that once a cat's over, it isn't coming back up. Mm. And, you know, if you listen and you look at all of the manuals and all of the instructions with cats, they pay an extreme amount of uh, lip service and instruction to reefing early. And they're reefing early because of the danger uh, and the, I'm sure the designers, even if they don't want to admit it, I'm sure the objective there is to make sure that the hull doesn't lift. Now, if the hull lifts as you're at the top of a breaking crest, that boat's going over and she's not coming back up. Mm. So for, for that reason, I think that's not compatible in particular. But also, you know, some of the nonsense that's being talked about is exactly that. Uh, yes, you've got great, now great abilities to uh, forecast weather on passage because you've got sat comms. But does that mean that you can avoid heavy weather? No, it means you can avoid the worst of heavy weather. But once you start getting into this nonsense about outrunning the weather, it's just that you can't turn around. Well, you could, but who wants <laughs> who who wants to get let's say three quarters of the way across the Atlantic, and then there's a big you know front coming and a massive depression coming your way, uh, and you say, oh well, I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll go back. You know, it's just simply not practical. Yes, you you can change your and I do too change my uh, voyage plan to take me up to uh, so that I'm avoiding the worst of that particular weather bomb or whatever system it is but to say you can outrun it mm. is just total nonsense and it's based on the assumption that the weather's cooperating for your plan to outrun it you know sometimes if there's a big system, it'll suck all the weather out of the area yeah. that you're in now yeah, and just yeah. leave you there floating around waiting well, for the I, I, So, you know, I'm afraid. I, I see a lot of it promoted around and, you know, my boat, you know, cats and trimarans and stuff, yeah, they can uh, outrun the weather. But, man, that's not where you want to be. You want something that can take the weather if you can't actually avoid it. I know there will be people that want to take the skin off my back and tell me how wrong I am about catamarans uh, and blue water cruising and how well they go upwind and how they can do this and this and this. But I just don't think they're compatible for it, you know, especially if you if you have to go upwind and, and you start getting that slam into the bridge deck. You know, it's not very pleasant, is it? There's a lot more to a blue water cruising boat. There's a lot more, you know, um, great cavernous cabins and saloons that you're going to fly across yeah. Um, yeah. don't work. A galley that you can't wedge yourself in and keep two hands free. And the motion is critical. And, and it's not accidental. You, you don't get a good motion of a boat. There's a huge amount of study that's got to go into it. It's to do with the cord length of the keel. Mm. The cord length of a Kraken keel is, is enormous. And if you're understanding then, the, the lead ballast mm -hmm. is fitting right the way along the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. So you're spreading its effect right the way through the boat. 
Right. Because what you don't want is that seesawing motion oh, around a pivot yeah, point. Like a pendulum. Yeah, yeah. You, you, it's going dunk, dunk. Yeah. No, not, not that way, mm. forward and aft. Yeah, for, forward yeah, and aft, yeah. dunk, 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 dunk. You don't want that. Mm. You want a boat that goes... Right. And, and she and she you know as John was saying and, and she tracks well uh, and you know the first time I sat on White Dragon we had any weather at all I was, I was in the galley we were sailing from Hong Kong to Taiwan I was in the galley and I was cooking everybody dinner and I can remember I put a glass down you know with, I did have a beer I must admit I put a glass down and I carried on doing what I was doing. And I thought, hey, hang on, I shouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. How's that? <laughs> and, and, and that's just because we paid, it's called the Ted Brewer motion okay. uh, quotient. Um, and you, you've got to look at distributing the weight of equipment around the boat properly and the position, of course, of the mast and the buoyancy of the stern and the buoyancy of the, uh, of the bow and, uh, and, and how the whole thing is pivoting around the fulcrum right. and uh, w that's what we've tried to eliminate um, and a fine entry bow is also really critical um, you will see most boats uh, have this beautiful round uh, profile uh, leading from the stem down to uh, the keel and what that does is slam the hell out of you yes All right i was wanted to ask you before is that um is that a performance decision that they've made or yes. is that a production molding thing <laughs> well, that's you're cheap and it, you know because <laughs> you said that the wine glass yeah. is hard to do yeah and yeah. I, so i immediately was like well that's why they do the opposite then <laughs> yeah one begets the other what the designers are wanting to do is um, provide plenty of uh, buoyancy uh before the keel to lift the boat so it goes faster right but we don't care about that you know we're not trying to win a race we're trying to enjoy passage making yeah. on a 10 or 20 or 30 days passage with 24 cartons of beer in the bow <laughs> most likely <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> so that lift you, you don't want to avoid it totally mm. and not have enough lift there but at the same stage you don't want that wide radius because it will slam mm. And from a design concept that gives you the lift, so from a performance cruising boat that works, I guess what, it's also cheaper to make that profile <laughs> and cheaper to make that mold. Mm. And and these are all little things, and, and they're all in my little, this book. Uh, mm. Books are still You've going. You've got to publish this book. The, the, <laughs> You've got to do the, it. There's the, a product here to be had. I'd read it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're probably right. I, I think, uh, you know, we've been asked to do a book of, uh, of a tw 12 month of uh, Ocean Sailor magazine, mm. which just to tell everybody is a free magazine. Um, it's, uh, it's sponsored and funded by Kraken Yachts, but it's not uh, just simply, yes, there is stuff about Kraken Yachts, but that's because most of what Kraken Yachts is about blue water sailing. And it's focused on the things that you need to know if you're gonna go off and you know, uh, blue water sailing. That's the whole focus of it. Could you tell us the story behind why Ocean Sailor magazine started and, and with regards to the article that would not be able to be published? Because I think that... that yeah, well, I, I will you. tell you, naively, I saw this gap in the market. I realised that nobody could fill it. Because guess what? I just tried to buy a boat to, to, <laughs> to do it and I couldn't find one. This is, you know, we're talking about four or five years ago, six, seven years ago now. So I couldn't find the boat I wanted. So I, you know, and I had people telling me, come on, Dick, build me a boat. But I had an opportunity uh, in my retirement to, to say, okay, look, I don't really want to sit in front of the TV and put my slippers on. And <laughs> I don't either believe in just sailing off around the world and I think you should sail around the world, not round the world, and there's a difference. Mm. So I thought, you know, hey, look, yeah, I can do this. I can see how we can do this, and I can see the market niche. And so I thought we'll, we'll come up with this design that's specifically blue water, and everybody will get it, and away they go. And 
that'll be what we won't have to advertise we won't have to do anything people will find us because it's obvious build it and they will come <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's obvious um, and it, that wasn't right actually um, it didn't happen like that and I think I, I like to try and think and understand the reasons why things happen and I think I know the answer if every boat builder you go to has the same design concepts bolt on kill blade hung rudder then it's not hard to actually come to the conclusion oh if I want a sailing boat then it's I've got a this is this is how it's going to be mm. but no it isn't it doesn't have to be like this so anyway we started cracking and then I started to realize that I'd got to be have my head further above the parapet and start to tell people about it and I talked to lots of uh, the mainline magazines UK and American and Australian uh, and uh, all of them said the same thing. Dick, hey, we, we really believe in what you're doing. Mm. We're not going to be able to write this story as you're telling it to us. So I said, well, why is that then? Said, because that's where most of our advertising revenue is coming from, <laughs> people that are building boats with bolt-on keels and blade-hung rudders. Ah, right, okay, so how do I get the message out? Mm. And as I said, by now I knew... Uh, uh, Dick Durham, we got talking about it. I said to him, you know, Dick, uh, I'm thinking that the only way I can really get this story out, if the magazines won't all run the unexpurgated uh, realities, then why don't we start a magazine, an online magazine? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to be there. I said, well, how about being editor? He said, yeah, I'll do that. He yeah, said, so... So Dick still writes for uh, Yachting Monthly. They're happy about that. Mm. And he edits for, uh, for uh, Ocean Sailor magazine and obviously uh, does a lot of the uh, journalistic stuff. So what if I think for a, cl a closing discussion, which we've, we've talked about cats and we've talked about the Kraken in a blue water context, and I think we've firmly established what that is. So there's other boats, other contemporary boats that are, not made for charter, they're bespoke and they're sort of, so they're made with the same ethos that a Kraken is, but very differently. So an example that comes to mind is like a Garcia, a mm. Garcia Explorer 45, I think. Mm -hmm. Clearly that's not made for charter. It's mm -hmm. made for yeah. serious sailing and, and J Jimmy Cornell, I think that's his brainchild, um, at, but it's wildly different. He's developed that boat for a different perspective. Right. Uh, and, and for a slightly different function than okay. us, you know, um, a Kraken, because it's strengthened by uh, Kevlar mm. uh, in its impact points, can certainly go up into uh, the colder climbs and to the high latitudes and withstand impact with uh, ice. Um, but he's, he's wanting something that you can lift the keel up Exactly. Uh, yeah. I, I, th there's a problem for me with that whole thing. One, I don't like too many moving parts under the water. Um, yeah. And, you know, it, obviously if you ground it, you're supposed to lift it so you don't ground mm. the lifting keel. But um, you, if, you, if you ground uh, that lifting keel, it's a possibility that it will jam. Uh, two... You, you you simply can't get the same writing moment mm. with a lifting kit. It's obvious you can't. Yeah. And most of the ballast in a Garcia is in the hull. Mm. That means it's got a smaller rig uh, and it, you know, a pro rata. Mm. Uh, and, it, and it's going to be more tender. It's going to have more motion and less writing moment than uh, a Kraken 50 with a, a zero kill with all the ballast right out there. Mm. And I believe twin rudders so that you can, it is, it is twin rudders, but, but so that the boat can stand upright when you're drying out. Right. Okay. So you lift the keel, yeah. you go in shallow, you let yeah. the boat dry out and she doesn't fall over yeah. because I believe that's the concept. Right. Uh, and I understand that. And, and if what you want to do is creep around the rivers and the mudflats and the shallow 
uh, places, that's maybe your boat. Mm. I don't think that's what most people want to do and think of when they go off world. For a, a it's it's a small bit, use, and, yeah. and, you know, take the dinghy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We get asked this question quite a lot. You know, can I go and sail the boat up into the you know, high latitudes? And my answer is yes, you definitely can. And we have uh, in Krakens an interior nav station in the saloon. And basically that is an autopilot watch station Mm -hmm. and you've got a great vision of the boat going forward and, and so forth. The alternative is to go more fully enclosed in the cockpit. But decide what you want to do because you will roast your backside out in with an enclosed uh, cockpit right, yeah. if you're in the tropical uh, tropical areas i'm certainly uh, you know not going to say that oh yeah you know garcia is a rubbish but not fit, fit for going blue water cruising mm. it's, it's actually a slightly different purpose i think you would say that maybe they are they still deserve the badge of honor if you will yeah i would say I, w- I would say they do deserve the mm. blue water uh, badge of honor mm. I, I can't as I'm standing here thinking and talking to you, I, I actually can't think of almost any other brand that, that does. Mm. Right, thank you very much for summarising what I... What, I love to hear people talk about all this stuff and I could listen forever, but the cameras can't, unfortunately. They're we're, we're yeah, rapidly yeah. running out of SD we, space. We've run out of time. Um, thank you very much for agreeing to meet us. And for the folks listening at home who want to hear more, like I do... Where can they find you? They can find us on uh, Ocean Sailor mag- in, in Ocean Sailor magazine, which is a free publication. They can find us on uh, the Ocean Sailor podcast, um, and that's where you would normally find your podcast. And they can find us on the Kraken uh, YouTube uh, channel. But I will also say, and I just like to say, in Ocean Sailor magazine, you know, gimme, 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 tell me, tell me about the things that you're thinking about. I'm lucky enough to sail a you know, quarter of a million miles or so around this wonderful planet. I've, I've enjoyed, I won't say quite every moment of it, but an awful lot of it. I'm totally convinced that people should do it. Mm. And, and I would also say at the moment, particularly at the moment, we've all had a very big lesson to learn, which is don't take your in extended life and abilities for granted right yeah sage words take it mm. if you're gonna if you've been thinking about doing it yeah go and do it it doesn't matter to me whether you buy a 20 year old boat mm. or you buy a new kraken obviously i'd love it was a new kraken but if you are going to do it um do your homework understand the principles of what you want mm. and just do it you know, just go and do it because it will, it will change your life. I'm still doing it after 50 years and I must tell you, you know, I'm hoping to keep carrying on for a few more years yet.